Hello, Namaste, and welcome to Agile Exploration Hub. I am your host Nagesh Deshpande, and this is another episode of Talks with Deshpande Ji. And we have a uh, uh, we have a guest uh, again. We are welcoming Balaji, and uh, we have already done one episode with Balaji on safe transformations. Uh, today we are having a discussion on uh, agile contracts and flexibility in agreement. So. I'll quickly uh, introduce Balaji in a very short uh, introduction. However, he has very uh, big horizon. His experience, his knowledge is, uh, you know, world spread knowledge. And uh, so Balaji has around 22 years of experience in IT uh, with 14 years experience in agile engagements, plus eight years experience as, uh, as an internal panel member uh, for multiple jobs or roles in agile. So today, the topic of the discussion is agile contracts, which is which is very niche topic. Um, not many have experience or knowledge about it. Our viewers would definitely like to know, learn about it. So let's welcome Balaji. Hey, Balaji, welcome. Hey, hi. Good. Glad to meet you. Yes. Nice meeting you once again. So this is the uh, for our audience. This is the second episode with Balaji. And uh, we were just discussing about the heat wave that India currently experiencing. Uh, I'm in Pune. Balaji is in Chennai. And I, I'm been to Chennai. So Chennai weather is pretty, I know it's very hot. So how is weather, Balaji? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The same thing here. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty hot and yeah, no, the i saw a notification on my mobile about heat wave and then the i have uh, you know the authority government authority said that not to go outside stay inside and so uh, on weather topic let's move on to agile now um I, i'm again repeating in second episode with balaji so balaji you know just tell us about uh, you know our viewer what are these agile contracts and uh, are there any type of contracts? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, for, first of all, from an uh, engagement point of view, right, uh, the, basically it is not just the implementation of the frameworks like uh, Scrum, Kanban, and this uh, safe. So, typically when we are actually executing a project or a program with some mm -hmm. client and a vendor kind of a, a setup or a ecosystem, we need to have at least some kind of a contractual obligation, some kind of a payment plan, some some kind of a clarity on how is that the invoicing and the billing will be done. So uh, both in a traditional waterfall model also, we, we had our other, you know, the, the, the contracts and uh, all those payment plans. Probably in an uh, agile driven uh, engagement or the context, it needs to be more adaptive on the go or rather more flexible on the go. Because here uh, mm -hmm. we know the we actually begin the project with the cone of uncertainty on the requirements, right? Uh, right. So right. that is one thing. This the second important point is um, even if you go by the lines of the agile ma manifesto, it is not mm -hmm. saying we actually should not have contracts. All the agile manifesto says is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. That actually doesn't mean that we should not have contracts. But what right. is more important when compared, no, value have, while you have value on the right, the value on the left is more than the value on the right. So even from my perspective, to even to collaborate with customer better, we need to have a robust and a flexible contract. Great, great. Yeah, so um, absolutely agree here, you know, mm. uh, the, what Agile Manifesto says. See, contract negotiation is the secondary. You know, your focus should be on the collaboration, customer collaboration, taking the feedbacks and accordingly work on the contract. That's what I, my understanding uh, uh, from that Agile Manifesto. Great. Yes. Moving on to the next topic. You know. uh, so now uh, we just discussed about the customer collaboration. But when you talk about contracts and, uh, you know, agreements and all that. So how this contract promotes these collaborations and flexibility in the project because now if i have a contract for an example if i have a contract so i have to follow the 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 terms and condition in it so flexibility may go out you know out of the window so how can i make sure the flexibility is also there 
and contract is also in the play see uh, typically what uh, what actually happens in the it industry is we have we have primarily two kinds of contracts one is called as a linear model contract second okay. is called as a non linear model contract okay, okay. now okay. primarily you can segregate it into two things in the case of a linear model we have some four or five types and in the non linear model also we have multiple categories but the funda but the funda here is linear model is typically more on the effort burnt not really more on the output or the outcome achieved oh i see oh, okay yeah, yeah that's why hmm. that's why in the in, in the in the case of a linear model we actually go for a time and material a fixed bid or fixed price contracts and also fixed capacity which we call as a pod as a service because for many engagement whenever the client or customer comes they actually ask for a fixed capacity give me these many hmm. people for this much duration whether you internally put it as eight squads or 10 squads or 10 squads or pods that is up to you so probably it could start with a, it could start with a staff augmentation model or it could okay. be a time and material or it could be a fixed price or a fixed bid or it could be a fixed capacity where pod as a service now this is called a linear model because mm. linear model will be suitable for teams with a lesser agile maturity i see okay because for a, for a team who is uh, beginning to learn agile and agile ways of uh, working we cannot expect them to be outcome driven always so mm. pra- from from a from a pragmatic approach whenever we are talking about linear models i tend to map the linear models to the teams who are learning agile Okay. okay, or rather okay. doing a change. Whereas any kind of a contract, like an output-based contract or outcome-based contract, or contracts which are non-linear models, those contracts will be suitable for teams who are already using agile and they have moved from doing agile to being agile, and they also okay. exhibited sustainability in agile ways of working. Okay. 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 So the primary, so 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 the so the primary funda funda here is. you uh, like uh, to improve the collaboration and the flexibility see what we what we generally do we used to put some contract clauses wherein there is a shared shared accountability between the client and the vendor right it is mm-hmm. not that vendor need to own all the risk some of the things need to be a shared accountability or a ownership between the client and the vendor and how are we going to put our communication plan how are we going to promote visibility and transparency all these factors need to be considered when we are writing a contract and one more thing is in my contract to foster the collaboration is there a way of incremental delivery based on the system demo based on the ah. team level de- demo and acceptance of the product can i have a contract so i think these are all some of the elements which we need to keep in mind okay great so summarize i, I what i understand i will summarize mm-hmm. it sure. so linear non linear is like you know someone which is forming and someone is like performing right so forming is where team is still learning agile and you know doing agile where performing is they actually executing and delivering faster and bringing sustainability also good good to mm. know that great so based on the yeah. so based on the maturity level also we see uh, from a from a system thinking approach we are anyway going mm. to talk on the same system right so the clauses right. of the uh, the clauses of the contract should resonate well with the overall landscape of that particular engagement so everything mm. need to be factored when we are writing a contract great good to know that so moving ahead uh, so can you share some examples you know agile contracts uh, which structures the enhancing of project outcomes so yeah so uh, see now what we actually do right now uh, for for example now let us okay let me actually make the answer very pragmatic so that it will add value to our viewers see whenever we are actually doing a large scale agile transformation or a large scale kind of a setup the discovery phase itself is going to take a months time right agree basically to study the existing landscape of the client or the customer or the prospect because when we are writing an rfp that particular uh, that particular thing is a prospect or a lead it is yet to become a client or a customer then that rfp will be translated into a sow which is a statement of work 
Now, the point to be considered is whenever we are embarking on a large scale transformation, discovery phase itself is going to take a month's time. And in my engagements, there are certain there are certain engagements where we have called out something called PI zero, program increment zero. Zero. Okay. Uh, PI zero. Okay. See, uh, in the latest version of SAFE, they have changed it to planning interval. However, if you go by the older versions of SAFE, it is called as a program increment. Be it a planning interval or a program increment, we are talking about a bigger container planning. So yeah. during the discovery phase, I used to put a clause called a lift off contract. Lift off contract. contract. Okay. What it means, it is like a flight which is running on the runway, but then yet to pick up the momentum to go high, right? Because, right. because in that one month, we are not actually going to release a potentially shippable increment to, to the client. So we cannot expect from the customer to pay a premium price point. Because see, any contract which is not trying to balance the needle between the vendor and the client is actually bound to fail in the long run. So the contract should actually till the needle and try to balance both the parties. I agree. Right? So, uh, uh, from my perspective, during the uh, you know during the discovery phase of the journey, we actually put something called as a lift off contract, okay, which will actually come yeah. with a lesser pricing point to the client. Whereas from the third sprint, fourth to fourth iteration, once the team picks up the momentum and starts delivering a potential shippable increment, there we can there we can do either you put an iterative contract or you put some kind of a contract which is based on number of stories accepted by the product owner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, uh, from my experience, writing a contract is an art. Though we have some science elements here and there, though we have some proven techniques, tactics, everything, actually taking the necessary thing from the landscape and then writing a winning contract, it's an art in itself. I agree. Yes, great. Because no, no certification teaches you how to respond to an RFP. Exactly. There is nothing. There is, it's very difficult to learn that. It's, it's for for me. It's on the on the job or it's art. You know, to learn from the uh, from your colleagues from your experience. Great. Good to know that. Yeah. No. No. So no, no. No. Just to add. No. No. Sure. Just to add one one more point is there there may be some kind of a engagements wherein mm -hmm. we need to validate the minimum viable product. Right. I agree. For example, right. in the case of an R and D kind of an initiative, I uh, the cone of uncertainty is very high, right? So what we used to put, we used to write a, 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 a clause saying, based on the validation or the outcome of the minimum viable product, further contracting guidelines will be strategized. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we need to do justice to the discovery phase of the engagement to really drill deep down, you no know, deep dive. To really un understand the subtle aspects or the intricate aspects of the engagement. If not, what okay. will happen? People will start working, then have so many challenges. I agree. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Moving next on to the next discussion, you know. So uh, when these are contracts, you know, and um, client satisfaction and project success, all these things matters. But what are the tips? to negotiate these agile contracts to ensure the client satisfaction and project success? See, first of all, uh, one thing is that when we are actually embarking on a journey, we need to be very yeah. clear on the definition of a success in that engagement. How is success, True. yeah, how is success, first of all, perceived in that particular ecosystem? If not, what will happen if you are not trying to converge the thoughts there, then later there may be a tug of war between both the parties. Right. So mm -hmm. one is that one is that the definition of success need to be very, very, very clear. The second thing is what are the KRAs? What are the KPIs? What are the metrics based on which the success will be calibrated or measured? That also need to be very clear. I think if you are doing some due diligence or justice at these two level, then creating the charter, creating and working agreement, and then creating a transformation roadmap, creating a plan to reach the goal, everything you know everything will be viewed as a continual approach rather than it you no know, rather than a discrete activity mm -hmm. right 
so when you are talking about you know uh, just to give just to give some of the uh, examples right let's say for uh, one of my kanban team i have written mm. a contract which is typically based on the output based or uh, outcome based so in that contract we have clearly told that uh, any kind of a sla breach needs to be fixed within 45 minutes of course depending upon the criticality of of that particular issue or a bug so sometimes contracts need to be really interwoven into the landscape it's not that i write a contract separately and then try to bring the contract and then plug it on to the landscape absolutely no you study the landscape you understand the intricate aspects of the of the ecosystem then think which contract will be suitable but in industry sometimes unfortunately they actually you know like we are actually trying to force a framework sometimes they force a contract and and so it breaks oh. mm. Right. So the, these are all, no. Some of, uh, no. Some of, uh, no. My thoughts for now. No, no. Great, great thoughts. Yeah. See, forcing, forcing always will bring, bring, build the resistance. You know, people may yes. not accept it, right? Naturally, it should go. It should go naturally by the flow, with the flow, what, whatever you call it. You know. So uh, until unless you put it in a such a way, if you put it in a forceful way, it will not going to work. That's that's very, very, very true. And I, I absolutely resonate what you said. agree yeah so moving on uh, can you share some insights on incorporating agile principles into contract negotiation there are there are 12 agile principles you know and they they are different Correct. you know so mm -hmm. when you trying to put each and every contract or maybe not all the principles but but uh, most of the principles into a contract how how are you going to do that so uh, see the the primarily you know when when we are trying to write a contract based on the validation of that de demo itself then we are actually giving importance mm -hmm. to uh, to the working software rather than just the documentation aspect of it right so mm -hmm. that's why we have our see demo happens at a three level one is at a team level iteration level demo then probably mm -hmm. at a art level we call it as a pi demo programming right. increment level demo and one of the demo could be at a release level also after the uat getting a completed i just want a quick check on the code before i ship it to the prod so mm -hmm. the the point what okay now one of the way to practically practically implement this concept is in terms of scope cost and time right because again and again be it a waterfall project or be it an agile project again and again we are going to play with the triple constraints of the project one is the scope mm. the cost and the uh, you know the cost and the time given that time. quality is okay. been internally factored now what i used to do is for all the contracts let's say let's say 12 12 types or 15 types we need to have clarity first of all ownership of the ownership of the risk with respect to scope with respect to cost with respect to time lies with whom whether the oh, vendor okay. or the client hmm. so what i'm trying to say is why in my in my practical implementation of umpteen contracts we have created an excel file kind of hmm. an excel file which is going to tell okay if this is the contract then probably the cost ownership is with the client whereas the scope and the time ownership is with the vendor so mm -hmm. what I'm, and this sheet will also be continuously revised continuously inspected and adapted based on the go right mm -hmm. so um, i i i may not take one on one uh, mapping between the agile principles and then you know tell you but that iterative thinking incrementally trying to build something always align to client centric business outcome always mm -hmm. trying to uh, eliminate the waste and having a continuous growth oriented mindset i think these are the characteristic traits which we imbibe whenever we are whenever we are responding to a contract and all these characteristic characteristic traits comes from the agile principles or rather mm -hmm. lean principles also okay so you put resi matrix also in this right see resi matrix typically we actually put it at a sow level you know the sow mm -hmm. w level we do not put okay. it at a rfp level generally okay mm -hmm. because the responsible accountable consulting informed it typically comes once the deal gets won let's say the let's say the deal gets won and mm -hmm. it is inside the funnel then we have more clarity on how to position our guys in the overall ecosystem but typically at an rfp level we actually we actually do not talk more on the resi matrix 
okay we actually talk uh -huh. more on the costing validating the assumptions dependencies limitations and the constraints mm -hmm. and going back to your example of you know having a demo at team level having a demo at uh, you know uh, art level or unprogrammed level is that also being documented uh, in the contract no yeah so in the in the contract whenever it mm -hmm. comes to the section of the payment milestones right if it is something mm -hmm. like an output driven or if it is something like an outcome driven we we actually put it as based on the demo based on the number of features accepted by the product owner let's say mm -hmm. uh, 45 percentage of the payment will be released which is typically a milestone driven payment milestone driven yeah okay mm -hmm. now now the, the 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 biggest challenge here is generally people tell hey fixed price will not work in an agile driven engagement because the scope is not fixed okay mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. actually what is the problem fixed scope is not the problem fixed cost is the problem see the point is if customer is not willing to pay you more but the customer keeps on increases the quantum of the work customer keeps on changing the quantum of the work there comes the problem so sometimes we need a little bit deep dive and see whether scope is the problem or marrying the scope to the cost is the problem what is the actual problem mm. okay now now based on my, based on uh, my experience right when i write a contract for a fixed price mm. i don't fix the scope but i fix the size see okay. there is a difference between size and this scope right? right size is like a water bottle this particular bottle scope is like what i pour inside the bottle Right? right i can pour water or i can you know pour some orange juice inside it but right. i am saying guys i will be i will be delivering you these many feature points mm. because at an epic level it is very difficult to quantify in terms of a story point level granularity I agree right so we actually define a connotation called a feature point and feature we point. clearly mm. and we clearly call out a one feature point means what that wall of reference need to be called out so we tell guys in this particular milestone one we are committing to give you 50 feature points acha got it now yes. what goes inside the feature point that thing i cannot commit now because i am not having more clarity on the scope of the work the nature of the work so sometimes we need to be very careful in choosing the words are we talking about a fixed size or are we talking about a fixed scope itself because the mm. scope is bound to get changed right? right 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 suppose if someone says the scope is not getting changed then the next question i will ask then why are you going for agile in the first place <laughs> right <laughs> yeah right mm. so i think only framework knowledge is not going to help us yeah. we need right. to be really strong in the pmi process areas right your pim box 6 or 7 talks about process areas right all the process areas we need to take the knowledge slightly tweak it based on the adaptive approaches of uh, agile and one more thing we need to have a very good grip on the ecosystem of the client right right so if yeah. i if i'm writing an rfp for a city bank just giving an example if i'm writing yeah. an rfp for a natwest bank or if i'm going yeah. to write an rfp for any other client for that matter at least i need to know what is the domain of the client what is the business operating model of the client how come this particular application is going to fit into the overall landscape of the client what is the unique selling proposition without understanding those things if i'm writing an rfp it's a generic solution it will not fit into them right it it may, may so so you gave examples of banks but you know I, if I, if it is a different client you know let's take yes. an example of insurance or even for a like a um, uh, hospitality event uh, mm. organization it may not work right you have to understand the business core business even uh, in some cases even their customers to 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 get into those details to understand you know what kind of solution what kind of features that i can give it to them good so you brought this topic you know having uh, core understanding or better understanding about the customers but building trust is also very important you know mm -hmm. and when we go into the contract you know so there there might you know we we touch base on trust you know should i should i trust this because this has been contracted now this is been so how you build trust in this contractual environment 
See, what is the best way to build the trust is to ensure that the trust is not broken in the first place by and large, whenever we are committing to small, small goals, right? See, right. for example, if I'm actually saying to the customer that a demo of this code will be done on Friday, I need to make sure that the demo will be done on Friday or at least give a Friday. heads up to them on Tuesday itself saying that due to these challenges, either we can demo only this much or, or if you want the full demo, probably I can do it on Monday next week, something like right. that. So one of the best way to build a trust is, first of all, from a commonsensical point of view, ensure that your trust is not getting broken in the first place in small, small micro goals. If, if right. someone is not able to achieve micro goals itself, then how are you going to deliver the entire, you know, the entire landscape? Now, coming mm -hmm. from a documentation point of view, one of the way to build a trust is, anyway, we are actually collaborating with the, with, the, with the customer on a frequent basis. We have our touch point calls, wherein we send the dashboards, we send the report, and then we, and we also work together with the client to tell at any point in time, we are always working on the risk-adjusted prioritized backlog. Okay. Mm -hmm. Risk-adjusted because Agile, you know, typically focus on a value-driven delivery. So at any point in time, your backlog needs to be prioritized, which is perfectly right. fine. But how are you going to factor the risk depending on the dynamics of the risk? based on whether you, you have created a mitigation plan or a contingency plan, or if you go by your program level roam board, what safe calls, resolved, owned, accepted, mitigated. At any point in time, if I'm working on a risk adjusted, prioritized backlog, and then promoting a culture of shared accountability with the client, promoting a culture of visibility and the transparency, I think trust will get built over a period of time from a pragmatic right. approach. Great. And uh, this yeah, and uh, transparency will also help. Yes. Like you yes. said, openness, you know, open, open about uh, you know, sharing the information, be transparent. Like you very well said, Friday, if the demo has been decided on Friday, be there. If it is not possible, if the change in the schedule, change in the, uh, you know, the agenda, share it up. Front. So that openness, that transparency will build more trust into the customer. Great. Yeah, now, yeah, just, a, just one point to mention here. Clients are always okay with things not getting done at the right time, provided the communication is given to them with a good amount of heads up. If I, if I tell to my customer saying that the June month release is going to have a problem because of A, B, C, D, and this is mm. the mitigation plan in April beginning, that is acceptable. But if I go to customer and tell this on June 1st, saying that June end release is not going to happen, no customer will actually you know, accept it. Like so, it. Mm -hmm. so, what, mm -hmm. so what we used to do is, uh, you know, uh, more from a, a project management point of view also, we actually create something called as a go green plan, mm -hmm. which, which I also talked in my safe video, right? So yeah, previous video yeah, we so, discussed. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So we actually talk, we create a go green plan and then, and then actually tell them this project is in amber because of these things. These are the series of activities which we need to do to take this project from amber to green or from red to amber to green. And, and these are the action items. These are the ETA and these are the action owners for the plan. So the moment you create a go green plan and then send it to the customer, the credibility level goes high. Right. Because you are not only talking about the problem, you are also giving them the solution, right? You are saying, guys, yes, agreed that there is a problem. However, this is the go green plan I have created. If we implement this plan, the needle can be moved from red to amber. So that information needs to be cascaded. Transformation will come later. If information itself is not there, then where is the transformation? So the so the moment I do all these things, I think automatically the credibility level goes high. Yeah. So again, you know, when we we discussed about contract, we in between we put time and material, fixed bait mm -hmm. and all that. So uh, this is in my past experience, I observed that in, in such setup, you know, um, innovative thinking, innovations, it's pretty challenging because normally those those things are go out of scope, you know where you are so how innovation can be incorporated in this you know agile contracts 
see typically typically in a service driven industry of course with my limited uh, with uh, my with my limited uh, experience i could say innovation is uh, always at the back seat billing and right. invoicing takes a precedence, precedence right yes yeah so uh, uh, when it see the um, see when it comes to innovation as long as as long as we are talking about creation of any accelerator or as long as we are talking about any enablers or any capabilities which could which could improve the predictability productivity responsiveness and quality it is acceptable because mm. any kind of an innovative solution should also yield me profitability if not Agreed. if not how am mm. i going to really plug that particular so called innovative entity in the overall landscape because we are not talking about building something for a nasa and all right we are talking about normal projects which actually float across so Agreed. some of the companies some of the companies have, have 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 that maturity level what what is that i have seen practically is they allocate some kind of a budget on a quarterly basis mm. for something called a factory of a tomorrow we call it as a fot okay capital f, f okay factory uh, capital of f mm. then you put a uh, o then you put a capital t fot mm. is a kind of a strategic theme strategic theme which is oriented to the r and d r and d kind of a uh, initiatives okay practically okay. Mm. so when they created my customized uh, agile framework also there you there you can see a strategic team called a fot which is for uh, r and d initiatives so whatever we are trying to talk here in kind of an innovativeness or kind of a capabilities and all somewhere it need to be parented to some solid foundation if not no just building that particular uh, utility in the in the name of in the name of uh, uh, innovation is not going to have a selling point hmm. because yeah. even for innovativeness someone need to fund the project right fund the initiative right who is actually going hmm. to fund it right and so uh, are these things also been taken care into the innovation sprint that safe talk about see safe talks about something called ip iteration wherein mm. we actually some kind of a code hackathons or or some kind of innovativeness can be can be implemented but the practicality is how many companies really use the ip sprint for innovation and planning good point <laughs> from a ground level from a ground level reality what happens in much of the companies is the last sprint which mm. we call it as an ip iteration innovation and planning in that the second week of the last iteration will be used for the planning of the next pi planning mm. of the next pi next the PI. first week of the last iteration will be used for fixing the code or code refactoring or any kind of a pending or a residual work right so though conceptually it is called innovation and planning see i am not saying innovation and planning cannot be done in that manner but the point here is there is always a ground level reality versus what has been prescribed in the books right Agreed. so uh, so generally innovation and planning what i have seen is the, the second week will be used for the planning of the next pi and the residual activities will be completed so what we have done i will tell we have created something called the system of a continuous improvement hmm. so we have system of a, system of a de delivery system of transformation and system of a continuous improvement so in the system of a delivery it is going to talk on the product road map milestone level planning your okrs and your product portfolio priorities your agile release planning when it comes to system of transformation it is more on the agile transformation road map followed by the coaching plan hmm. when it come to system of continuous improvement we create something called the kaizen backlog kaizen backlog there yeah. in the kaizen backlog as part of our continuous improvement we we have some place holders for all this particular innovation and you know trying to improve the operational efficiency by building some kind of a utilities and all ai driven utilities and all now the now the ground level challenge here is in in some of the it companies is your system of delivery will show bigar just an example okay analogy your system of transformation will show noida okay your system of continuous improvement will show will actually show uh, hyderabad means energy is getting dissipated here and there hmm. that's where the role of an enterprise agile coach or some senior strategic leader 
comes there who ensures that the system of delivery system of transformation system of continuous improvement need to synergize or need to resonate with each other if not mm. your product roadmap will talk about something your transformation roadmap will will talk about something your continuous improvement will talk about something energy is getting dissipated these right. are all the systemic issues which we need to fix it good great moving on to last question today is last yeah, sure. so if if a person like me or someone who is mm. you know growing their agile in in their agile career if yes. they want to read learn about agile contracts are there any websites any videos available or any trainings available ah uh, yes you see the, 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 uh, we have lot of uh, videos on the youtube which is going to which is going to talk about agile contracts and you can find my own videos also i myself have made some agile contracts videos now okay. now the now the game is like this knowing agile contracts is actually one thing taking using the right contract at the right time is something else We, that will come we, by experience right yes yes so we, you have some 12 to 15 contracts and you know the pros and cons of all the contracts but given a situation which contract to use hmm see for the same client for the same client on the initial days i have went by a time and material let's say hmm. or rather a fixed price but after 6 months after 8 months once the maturity level started improving then i changed the contracting needle to outcome driven or a uh, output driven but the client is same right so but but then the maturity level keeps increasing right so uh, one of the way is that okay, one, one of the way to one of the way to master this particular subject is we we need to be very clear on in terms of the scope cost and the time given this contract who needs to have the ownership okay Hmm. okay so because that is a very important part okay and uh, everything cannot be documented also it most of the things emerge out of conversations back and forth back and forth right so the, that is actually one thing and one more thing what what people can do to know the contracts is start participating in a responding to rfps okay hmm. right apart from apart from working on your day in and day out bau projects because uh, he, uh, even to today sometimes i actually contribute to uh, writing rfps so when i mm. respond to rfps i actually interact with the delivery manager release train engineer enterprise architect compliance officer so the people with whom i interact are heterogeneous varied user personas so i get more thoughts those thoughts needs to be factored when you really write an rfp and an agile contract great okay now one more last point what i wanted to say is nowadays many companies actually wanted to do something like a dynamic budgeting dynamic budget dynamic budget gone are the days we only do annual budgeting right because for a company to have a business agility in a sustained manner you need to have a dynamic budgeting right so we have we have multiple tools in the market like you have a target process even jira align started to support dynamic budgeting you have a micro focus you have jellyfish and you have some okay. tools like a, like a task top integration hub and wis these are all the tools which are primarily for value stream management platform okay for example okay. target process value mm-hmm. stream management platform of course it supports the element of a dynamic dynamic budgeting and there is a concept called the uh, zbb zero based budgeting okay means i will never look into the past i will start the things from a clean slate from the scratch now so it is called okay. zero based budgeting trifecta okay so if 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 uh, if uh, if a person need to be good in all these uh, uh, agile contracts one need to know all these concepts just hmm. knowing the uh, g- um, just knowing it on a high level like is not going to actually you know uh, help them now no no uh, primarily no why, why it is called as a tri tri why it is called as a tri factor because we have an uh, element in the cost transparency and hmm. we have an element in the uh, resource uh, alignment okay? okay one is the cost transparency second is the resource alignment and the third is called the continuous improvement these elements are factored in it so it is called tri 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 factor so these concepts need to be known to people if not how they can write effective contracts 
agree absolutely there's so much to learn there's so much to learn and uh, you know so much to um, gain from all this you know information great it was wonderful discussion so much to learn so many things so many unknown factors so many unknown things here you know we can explore and all that uh, again once again thank you balaji for for giving us a time um, we definitely will have you know further more discussion on this topic i know this we have only half an hour for uh, today um, sure. so uh, great insights once again and uh, uh, i would like sincerely would like to say thank you uh, to my viewers if you like this discussion please like the video share with your friends if you have any questions for balaji do put it in the comments uh, yeah. all the details about balaji is uh, linked in papali's website his youtube channel will be available in the description video and uh, and uh, like uh, people who wanted to know wanted to learn from me they can actually you know connect with me i have like i have my own agile mentorship program wherein i teach all these real time capabilities also so whosoever you know committed to grow and excel in their career can reach out to me by all means please do enroll to his mentoring pro pro programs thank you balaji and yeah. uh, once again yeah namaste so all and uh, thanks to you also for giving me this particular opportunity cheers yeah. cheers thank you